Thanks for joining listeners. This is Turning Dirt. I'm John Mazer. Turning Dirt is the podcast where we talk thing, everything agriculture and maybe a few other topics. The episode's powered by Mazer Group, 18 locations across uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Uh, your family owned and operated New Holland dealer. Very special guest with us today, Mr. Michael Carter from C2 Farms. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure seeing you, man. Likewise. Uh, can you give us a snapshot of the operation? I know, um, yeah, originally from Provost, but I know you've got a few operations. Like, yeah, you've got one just to the south of us here, Operation in Provost. Give us a shot of that. Yeah, sure. So maybe I'll just uh, back up and start right at the beginning, I guess. I like that. A little, yep. bit, of, little bit of family history here. So. Yes. So I am a fourth generation farmer along with my brother. Um Family started off in Many Berries, Alberta, Southern Alberta. And then actually, the, I think there was a government program to relocate them out of Southern Alberta in like the early 1920s because it was so dry down there. People were starving. B- Many Berries Ma- a town? Ma- yeah, I, I think so. Wow. Okay. Yeah. We don't so, know if it exists still. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So there was a there was a program. They moved them uh, from Many Berries and started moving them north. And uh, we always used to tease Grandpa why he stopped the provost. We're not sure. You know, if we could have stopped somewhere with a few less rocks, that would have been would have been ideal. But uh, <laughs> nonetheless, Provost Alberta is where where he stopped, so that that's home for us. So, um, so yeah, the original family farm is still there. Um, you know, it was three sections. I guess growing up, you know, Dad had a job in the oil patch, just like pretty much everybody else did in the '80s, right? You know, super high interest rates, low commodity prices. So, yeah. Um, so yeah. he was operating, sorry to interrupt you, he, nope. was, he was running the farm and working in the oil patch at the same time? Yeah, I mean, really, the it wasn't, you know, it was more than a hobby farm, but yep. it was it was something that happened kind of, you know, after the, the oil and gas business was right. looked after for the day, right? So, um, yeah, it was uh, it was a lot. Yeah. It was, uh, it was busy. There was no no lack of work ethic around No, there, that's, that's right, sure. yeah. And so when did the when did the sprawl <laughs> to uh, Saskatchewan happen? Yeah, well, again, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. Just sorry, kind of, I'm kind of, sorry, yeah. No, 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 so it makes a little bit of sense. So um, I graduated high school in 2002. That was the worst drought I had ever seen. Didn't pull the combine out of the shed. Farming wasn't looking all that sexy in 2002, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, haven't been kind of exposed to the oil patch growing up. Um, you know, I went to Edmonton to university. wasn't smart enough to be an engineer, so I guess kind of the fallback when you can't be an engineer is you're a geologist. So, so I did. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I did a did a four year science degree with a specialization in geology. I took the five year route to get it. There was some time in Australia in, in between there, but anyway, I ended up as a geologist in Calgary. 2007 was my first year in Calgary, I guess. Uh, did five years total as a geologist in, in Calgary, but about three or four years into that, kind of went, yeah, downtown Calgary's fun. But after you've done downtown Calgary as a 20-something-year-old, you know, novelty kind of starts to wear off. Maybe this farming thing wasn't so bad after all, right? It's a disease, honestly. You're, like, you're, <laughs> it's you're, in your blood and it's stuck. It's with you. You're yeah. born with it. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so... You know, kind of started thinking about going back. And at, at that time, Dad had the farm rented out because, uh, you know, my other younger brother had gone away to school too. Um, but yeah, so the farm was rented out. Kind of had the conversation with him like, hey, would you would you rent me the family farm if I came back from Calgary? And, you know, I, th- I think Mom and Dad pushed me to stay in Calgary. It was a, it was a pretty good job and honestly lots of opportunity there, right? But, uh, yeah, I think it was 2008 or nine somewhere in there. I uh, rented the farm back from dad, tried to do both simultaneously, you know. Like the geology thing and the... Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. So I was, I was farming, whatever, 1,600 acres on, you know, weekends and holidays, essentially. Miling out my, my little car, ripping back and forth from Calgary to Provost, and that got old. So uh, something had to go. And uh, yeah, so I, uh, I kicked the geology career to the side and uh, came back and yeah, Started being a full time farmer, I guess. So nice, nice. So that's a so. big decision then, because I mean, like, and you, and you said that your parents actually tried to talk you out of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, the original phone call. I think there might have been some tears. Well, follow, follow, like after about a thirty second pause, I'm pretty sure mom was, you know, softly weeping to herself. There, but uh, anyway. <laughs> oh um, well, well, I'm sure you're making her proud now. So the tears, it's tears of yeah. joy now, Michael. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it, it's, it's been a journey, but it's, it's been fun. So. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, so was back in Provost, uh, living with my brother and grandpa and grandma's old house on the farm there. Um, opportunity to buy some land in Marsden, Saskatchewan. So like Provost right on the Alberta Saskatchewan border, right? So yeah, some opportunity to, to buy some land there came available. So we I was think about three thousand acres, which was that was a huge splash for us, right? Sixteen hundred to three thousand was a big deal. Uh, farmed that for about three years, dragging equipment back and forth. Um, and I, you know, when I was in Calgary, I'd been looking, kind of canvassing Saskatchewan, knowing that at some point in time I was going back to the farm and that, you know, it was just cheaper land in Saskatchewan, right? So um, anyway, I got the call from a realtor that uh, some land south of Regina was going to be for sale. And I mean, anybody that knows Regina farmland knows that, I mean, it's kind of the, it's the mecca of farming in Saskatchewan, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, it sure is. So obviously that was pretty exciting. <clears throat> Came down, had a look at it. I mean, it was yeah, it was, it was amazing. It was, yeah. Caught your eye right off the yeah, bat. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, we made a deal to, to spin off or to sell the, the land we'd bought in Marsden. Sold that. We ended up down here in Regina in 2000 and fall of 2012, I guess. And, uh, yeah, this has been home ever since. So yeah, uh, right on. So you're like just stepping on 12, 10 years. So I guess 11 years yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I didn't, so. I, I thought, I, uh, and I originally thought that the farm started here and that Provost was the sprawl. No, no Provost, Provost was the original, uh, the original homestead. So. No kidding. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, like, I mean, uh, to use your words, the Mecca of farming here, I couldn't agree with you more. Like, and it was a really shock to, uh, not a shock to us. We always knew what we were getting into here when we came from Manitoba to Saskatchewan, but the, just the broad acres here. Yeah. And like, I mean, the, as far as the eye can see is farm farmable land. Yeah. And it's just, you know, you know Manitoba, we've got some areas like that, but certainly nothing like this. And yeah. I mean, it's just, as again, to say the Mecca of farming is a no better, no better way to put it. So yeah, uh, yeah you keep going. Yeah. So like, yeah, I guess, like I said, 2013 was our first crop here south of Regina. Uh, I can't even remember. I think it was around 22,000 acres or something we put in here. So again, like, you know, massive jump, right? Like, Huge. you know, I think we were doing, uh, 6,000 maybe in Provost when we came. So 6,000 to 22,000. I mean, it was, uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. Honestly, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a farm for sale and you bought it. And that, that was the size of the farm that, that was for sale was 22,000 acres. Yeah. 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 You know, it sounds bad. I can't even really remember That's okay. the exact numbers, but somewhere in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and honestly got really fortunate and kicked an uh, amazing year right out of the gate, right? 2013 was a little on the wet side, but um, the crops were fantastic. So Awesome. So yeah, kicked a good one right out of the gate and yeah, never really looked back. And I guess we just been kind of, you know, slowly growing it ever since. So, um, you know, uh, for the spring of 23, we'll put in, you know, right around 60,000 acres. You know, that would include Provost. Provost is around, you know, call it 6,000 acres now. So about 54,000 acres here in Saskatchewan, I guess. Um, we got a few more in the pipeline kind of coming on stream over the next couple of years. So uh, that's exciting. Pretty excited about that. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. We're, we're spread out across Saskatchewan now. So, um, you know, yeah, it's a bit of a challenge, obviously, yeah. you know, operationally, right? But we're we're kind of figuring it out and we got a lot to learn still, but we're, we're, we're getting there. So. Yeah, right on. Yeah. So... Um, so is there, is there, obviously you have a, a growth strategy here or, um, you know, a growth strategy in Saskatchewan. Cause I mean, there's some time, some, uh, land coming down the pipeline, as you said, um, provost, is that kind of like, uh, are we kind of in limbo there or is that kind of well, the size we want there? Yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, my, my brother and I work really well together, but yeah. I'm, I'm probably, you know, known as being the, the more aggressive one of, of the two, right? So, um, you know, and that's no knock against him. He does a fantastic job there in Provo. So he he's he lives in Provo. Him and his family there live, uh, well, on, on our grandparents' uh, farm. Original so, house? Uh, well, not, so this is an interesting story too. I think the, the house there now was built... Uh, Dad will get mad at me for not knowing this, but sometime in the early 70s, you know, they've, they've got it and you know, sure. it's turned yep. it into a really nice place. But actually the original homestead there, we, we never knocked it over. So there's a little, like, like honestly, it's not any bigger than this room. And it was turned into a greenery in subsequent years. But that was the, that was the original house when they moved from Manyberries to Provost. And the field that it's on, we call it down home. 
No way. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of cool every time. Yeah. I remember pulling the pulling the the air seeder or the at that time the old hole drill like box drill through there, and you'd always end up with a, a horseshoe or some sort of you know yeah yeah something you'd have to go bang off the the, the point something there. getting caught in there yeah exactly yeah. so no way well that's yeah. great yeah so so brothers looking after the operation in Provost yeah. uh, you reside here obviously in in uh, Regina yeah. Um, give me a, give us a snapshot of the size of your, of your staff and, and do you have, um, do you have many, I guess year round staff or do you, and do you hire in, do you hire in uh, seasonal workers? How does that, how does that play out yeah. for you? Oh man, it's, um, you know, as you can relate, I'm sure, I mean, uh, labor is a, labor is a, a big challenge right now, right? I mean, it ha- has been in agriculture for a long time. Um, it's getting easier for us, I, you know, being the outsider, you know, in a new area, you know, small town Saskatchewan can be pretty clicky. Right? Oh so yeah, it yep. uh, wasn't easy in the beginning, but um, it's it's getting easier. And we just we've been around long enough now; people are kind of getting to know us, and uh, so it, it's getting easier. Um, we've got about uh, you know, I, I guess across Saskatchewan, um, got about fifteen full time employees now. Uh, and then obviously in the in the you know the busy season, you got to ramp up, so that, that you know more than doubles, I guess, in the in the, the growing season. Um, we're finding though that you, you have to keep more year round staff and you know, we, we used to think, well, y- y- these guys aren't going to be that busy for a couple months in the winter and that's fine. But that, that's honestly changing. I don't like this winter we just came through. Th- honestly, there was no downtime. It was, is that right, it was man? as busy as, as I can remember. So, um, yeah, we're having more and more full-time staff and, and that's good because we you know with full-time staff come, you know, more local people, right? They're immersed in the communities that we're operating in. And I think that's been a big part of why we've had more success as of late, you know, finding good people, right? Yep, um, absolutely. You know, word of mouth, right? Yep, so, yeah. Not only that, yeah. I mean, yeah, they, <clears throat> you obviously you train them to, to your operation. And I mean, like the old saying goes, good, tel- good help is hard to find. And it, and it really is when it comes to farming because there has to be a, there has to be some sort of, of knowledge there of the industry. And I mean, you're, you're putting, you're putting guys, uh, you're putting guys behind the wheel of, of, you know, very expensive equipment with so many variables. There has to be that knowledge there, or you have to be alongside them to teach them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a challenge. Um, yeah. And we far from like, we don't have it figured out. We're far, far from perfect here yet, but, um, you know, pro- process, right. Um, yep. we just been, we've been very diligent about, uh, you know, kind of writing it out, uh, you know, we have standard operating procedures for just about anything. I mean, it seems silly, but if you want to change a light bulb, there's an SOP for that basically, right? So, yep, um, absolutely. I can understand that because we have one here for changing the water jugs. There the you water go. Machines. See, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a way to do everything, yeah. Michael. Yeah, yeah. And if we can get everybody on the same page, it makes it easier 100%, for everybody. 100%. So, yeah. you know, and I think there's a little bit of pushback in that, right? Because farming farming is kind of unique in that it, it we're still the wild, wild west really, right? In terms of industry. Um, so we've kind of had to not, not just us, but other operations, you know, like us, I guess have kind of had to, you know, champion this or pioneer this a little bit. Right. And I know there's others out there that are doing it far better than we are, I'm, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. It's been challenging. Um, yeah. Um, it, it's really cool to see that when you get a team that kind of, you know, commits or unites behind, okay, this is the goal. Yeah. I mean, we don't like all these things that we have to do, but we understand why we're doing it. And if you can get that process happening for, and it doesn't take long, like three, four months, it's pretty cool to see how the team kind of, you know, comes together and, and really moves the ball forward. Right? Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you ever seen the movie Moneyball? Yeah. 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 And, and, and what, that, what you just explained <clears throat> reminds me of that movie because it, it was all about that, and really quickly here, it was all about getting that team on the mindset of yeah. just scoring runs. Yeah. And it was funny because the in that movie, the last person to come on board with the with the uh, strategy was the coach. I don't know if you remember the, remember the moment when, like, he decided to put uh, – Hatterberg in, I think it was, who was the f- back catcher turned first baseman and he hit the home run to win the 20. But I mean, yeah, I'm rambling here, but yeah. it, 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 it really takes a team with the same vision. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. And, you know, to, to use your analogy there from the movie, I mean, that's that's one thing I've had to get my head around a little bit, I guess, if I, you know, if, if I'm the coach, so to speak, you know, referencing that that movie there. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been tough. There's a, you know, a few times where, you know, the the people that I've trusted to make decisions for me, you know, they, they make a decision and it's, uh, maybe not necessarily the one that I would have made, but you, you have to realize that you can't, uh, you know, you you can't butt heads with them all. You got to get behind them and support them a hundred percent. And, uh, Hey, you know what? Nine times out of 10, it works out fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Very well said. So on the topic of staff, Michael, um, you know, and talking about getting all the staff on the same page and having the same, um, having the same kind of vision, um, in a segue a little bit into the role of technology and getting the staff on the same page. Now, you know, we can talk for hours probably about automation on the, on the combines and, and, and automation <clears> on every, anything, which is a, yeah, we'll get into that, but the role of technology, I mean, it's come a vital part of a farm your size. Um, where do you see it going? How do you see it? You know, uh, you know, we could talk about automation on combines. It, uh, it's, it's automated, but it's not at this point. I know that we're going down a road that will probably have <laughs> autonomous combines, but I mean, again, there's so many variables in that in in, in that uh, piece of equipment itself that I feel that there was always be a human factor in it. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess we can jump off there on the the automated combine piece. I mean, I don't even know how many years. When when did New Holland first come out with that? Was it? Is it twenty twenty? I want to say twenty twenty one. I yeah. think. Is it yeah, earlier than that? That might have been 19. A- yeah. Anyway, um, certainly seen that get leaps and bounds better. Even oh, yeah. The, the short period of time that, uh, that, that that's been out, right? So, um, yeah, it, it's, we're, put it this way, in 2019, I think that's the year that it debuted. Let's just say that. Let's say it was 2019. It was probably more of an impediment than it was a help at that standpoint, just, you know, on our end, teaching people that, hey, let the combine do its thing, you know, you guys as a dealer, the manufacturer, still working through some of the bugs. Um, but that being said, it's a huge tool for us now, right? Uh, and again, it comes back to the point that we made earlier about everybody having to kind of fall in line behind the process, right? So, you know, there's an SOP for how you run your combine. There's a full piece in there on the automation, how you kind of let it, you know, do its thing. Um, yeah, and it's uh, it's really alleviated a lot of the, uh, you know, the the pressure, I guess, of the training that we have to do with these guys. Um, we find now that the, the focus is more on, uh, you know, training a person, understanding the fundamentals of how a, a combine works rather than just, uh, hey, you know, speed the rotor up when we tell you to yeah. speed it up. Push the button right? here. So, yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And it, I, I would say that, you know, if you had a, it, it's really helped people progress in their understanding of, of how the machine works. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's been kind of neat to watch. You have, uh, you know, some seasonal guys that have basically never been on a combine before. And, and these are smart kids. Like, don't, don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. Their, yeah, these are smart kids, but they've never been on a combine. And, uh, well, the, the one guy, I'll, I'll never forget, uh, I think it was the first year we had the automation. I, I'm pretty sure he read the manual for a CR 8.9 cover to cover. Like, <laughs> he's an, 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 he just uh, wanted he, to he, know. He, he's an yeah, Austrian guy, Thomas. Thomas, we'll have to, we'll have to, we'll have to send him this episode. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah. anyway. We'll have to get him on here one day. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, he was telling me about the, the pressure differential sensors, the pressure between the top and bottom sieve. And he's like, yeah, I think I figured out why you're having a problem, you know, with your canola loss or the, you know, clean sample or whatever it was. And I was like, what are you talking about? There's, no, there's no sensor in there that measures pressure. <laughs> yeah, it opens up the manual to page, whatever, 401 a, and yeah, there it is. And it's like, we had the parameters in the monitor totally wrong because I, I didn't even know that sensor existed to be honest with you. But uh, <laughs> that's anyway. what the manuals are for. Yeah. yeah. But this, you know, it's, I guess back to my point, this is a kid that you know, never sat on a combine before. Right. Absolutely. And, and so the, yeah, that, it, I'm going to get kind of down a, a, a rabbit hole here a little I bit. I like rabbit holes. Yeah. Go. It, uh, it, I think the technology that we're seeing come into farming now, it's, it's attracting a totally different segment of the population to ag than what we've ever seen before. Right. And at first you're like, well, you know, these guys have never set, set foot on a farm before. How, how practical, or how useful are they going to be? Right. Yeah. And honestly, some of our best people are people that have no farming background at all. It's fresh out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's attitude. It's attitude sure. mindset, you know, um, yeah, but it's pretty cool to watch how they latch on to some of that that technology and, yeah. and really run with it, right? So, yeah, yeah. Well, um, it's such a big part of the farm now, right? And I mean, yeah, going back to automation, and yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it is it is changing the industry, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was I was just trying to think back to your more your original question, like how how we use technology with staff, and uh, honestly, I can't think of any good answer. Like, there's there's nothing, uh, there's no secret sauce there. I mean, you, you know, you have everybody has this now, regardless of the business, I'm sure. But you know, like you know, for your your hourly guys, you know, there's apps that you know track time and location and you know all that kind of good stuff, right? Um, 
you know, we, we use a, a platform, it's a web-based software, but you're, you're pushing tasks to your specific operators, right? And, you know, all those tasks will have, <clears throat> you know, what product they're spraying or what, you know, whatever tasks you're supposed to be doing. It's all there. It's laid out. You know, is it huge? No. Does it eliminate, you know, some phone calls back to their superiors? And ab- Absolutely, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, it, you know, that's just helped with timely information that those people need to, to be able to carry on with their job, right? Sure. Um, and it's, there's a huge opportunity ahead of ag and i I think and we've come a long ways in terms of technology and tracking data and all that stuff but we're really we're just we're in the early like we're in its infancy here still right tip of the iceberg tip exactly and i don't think anybody's really nailed it yet in terms of you know data capturing platforms and what you do with that there's a lot of a lot of cool stuff happening a lot of really cool ideas but I don't think anybody's nailed it yet. No. And it's, somebody will eventually. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not there yet. Yeah. Um, yeah and, I, and I think, you know, what's, what's kind of neat is I think it might be uh, industries outside of ag that actually help drive it. Like, you know, AI, for an example. Well, you were mentioning Joel Rogan before we jumped on here. Yeah, yeah. A, a buddy sent me a link um, uh, this week sometime. It was a podcast with Joel Rogan. Started listening to it, and five minutes in, I realized that it wasn't even the whole podcast was generated by this chat GPT or whatever. I've heard of this. It, you should go check it out. It, I will. It blows your like. It's, it's crazy. So they essentially they made a this chat GDP made or whatever it's called made a podcast to sound like Joe Rogan, but it yeah. was not a Joe Rogan yeah. podcast. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Wild. It's, it's wild. And it's like, like if you'd never listened to a Joe, like you would have thought, well, yeah, this, you wouldn't know this is a real thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy. Anyway, we kind of digressed there a little bit. No, but, that's all um, good. Yeah, I wanted to. I want to <clears throat> hop on a topic that I, I've I heard you say it, and I heard it discussed within your farm, and that was the low traffic. Is it low traffic or oh, minimal traffic, yeah. or should we even go there? No, let's 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 go there. Why not? Okay. Uh, yeah. If if any of our farmer operators are listening, they're like you know facepalm right now. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> this is why we want to go there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not my idea. It's not, you know, nothing that we're doing that's, that's cutting edge by any stretch, but um, so it's CTF controlled traffic farming. Um, I think it really got its legs in Australia. <clears throat> um, yeah. So basically, uh, Oh, there's a guy in Alberta, Steve LaRock that I've talked to lots about it. And he just says, well, it's really simple. We're just driving in straight lines. And, and honestly, that's, that's what it is. So, um, on the same line, though. Exactly. So yeah. I guess for yeah. people that have never, you know, really heard of this before, um, you set up pre-designated tram lines in your field, and the goal is is to have, you know, as many of your implements run over as many of those common tram lines as you can, right? So the idea is is that you're you're minimizing compaction across as much of the field as you can. You're making a highway down that, you know, whatever the small percentage of the field that you are driving down. Yeah, it's it's not going to be very productive land. You know, in fact, most guys that you know get down the road far enough, they don't even see those tram lines. Right? Oh, really? Yeah. So, is it something so, that you, do you practice it on your farm, or is it? it we're, is it? It's um, it's a constant evolving goal, I would say. Um, it's been a bit of a challenge because you know none of the equipment manufacturers in Canada are really geared towards it, right? In Australia, they are. Actually, even even Borgo, so mentioned a you know a good yep. you know Saskatchewan based company. Yep, um, they have models that they build here in Saskatchewan for the Australian marketplace that are you know purposely built for CTF. Really? Yeah. So it's you know it just shows you how how popular I guess it is in, yeah. in Australia, right? Yep. So you know their air carts, for example, they can. I don't think you can get it on the big ones. Um, there's a Borgo sales rep uh, getting mad at me here somewhere, but um, I think it's on like, I think the biggest you can get is a 700 bushel. Again, built in St. Bruce, Saskatchewan, uh, shipped to Australia, but the, the the axle spacing on it is purpose built for, most systems are three meter systems, so three meter kind of tram lines. Uh, obviously there's limitations to the tires and stuff like that you can you can put on it but uh yeah it's it's simple we're just driving in in straight lines uh with as many pieces of equipment over that same tram line as we can and and the goal is to again minimize compaction um as you minimize compaction you uh, the, the soil begins to kind of heal itself i guess right and so you get, you start to get more pore space in the soil so you get more room for water infiltration which you know is fantastic for us it, it can kind of buffer your extremes both wet and dry right so in a dry year you have more pore space you have more water holding capacity for that soil right so that 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 soil it's it's a bigger sponge 
it can hold more water to sustain you through that dry period that we get until that next rain comes, right? Yeah. So, and, and conversely, in the wet seasons, uh, again, more pore space. So you get that big downpour, you know, farm progress show weekend and everybody's in the beer gardens and it's raining cats and dogs. Yeah. Yeah, when you get that rain event, the three inches in half an hour, whatever you get, you know, there's more there's more room for that water to go. So rather than cause surface flooding, it goes into the soil where it's stored for, well, the, the next dry cycle that comes around inevitably, right? So, right, right. So yeah. theoretically, I mean, it, it makes complete sense. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, theoretically, it's like, well, this is a no-brainer. Yeah. But it's one of those things where on paper it makes a lot of sense, and in practice it's it's tough to implement, right? Yes, um, yeah. yeah. You know, th- think of a grain cart. So you've got, whatever, eight combines in a field, you know, how practical is it for your grain cart guy to say on a set of tram lines, right? I mean, you know. It's not at all. It's not at all. No. So, yeah, like I don't even know how you do that, actually. Yeah, I, well, if you if you know, let, let me know because we, ha- <laughs> we haven't figured it out yet either. But uh, actually, again, in Australia, they've got uh, little conveyor belts that they kind of mount on the side of their grain cart so that the grain, like, yeah, the grain cart doesn't need to veer in to get under the center of the unloading spout of the combine. Come on. Combine unloads onto like a conveyor belt. The conveyor belt takes it into the grain cart because they're really? they're, they're serious about CTF in in Australia. It sounds so, like it. Yeah. My goodness. But it's they've had to be. I mean, it's yeah. you know uh, adversity breeds innovation, right? And I mean, Australia's a it, it's a challenging place to farm. Weather extremes are you know more than more than what we have here, and there's no crop insurance. None. None. I mean, well, if your crop burns down, you can yeah they'll insure you for that. But if it's too dry, too wet. Grasshoppers oh, eat it. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, you're on your own. Yeah. You're on your own. And the other, like, not again, getting off on a tangent here. You're but, not uh, at all. I love it. Yeah. Forty percent loan to value ratios in Australia. Really? Yeah. So I mean, it's it's tough. Yeah. It's no tough. kidding. But uh, yeah, I guess to get back to to how we're implementing that here on our farm, um, we're we're getting there. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it's been a challenge just with some of the manufacturers not having. You know, axle spacing isn't purposely built for CTF here in Canada. And I'm not going to be the guy that goes and gets my cutting torch out and cuts into a <laughs> million dollar Borgo air drill. You're not going to do that. I'm not, not going to do that. No, uh, we thought about it. Yeah. But yeah a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. We're, 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 we're not going to do that. So we, yeah, we've, we've learned that we just kind of have to compromise. Gotcha. Man. And uh, I think again, Steve LaRock would, uh, would, correct me here but you know basically i think if like anything under 15 percent of your total field you know that's being driven on or compacted they consider that a win and so how we've gotten there without having to you know take the cutting torch and cut into a new piece of equipment is we've just gone to really wide implements right gotcha. and we can do that here right yep um yeah so we had you know 160 foot booms on the sprayers which you know nowadays are becoming more common but you know when we started it whatever five six years ago it was kind of you know the we were the new guys on the block with the such yeah. a huge spread. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and yeah. Being the first isn't always the best, right? So there's some challenges that came with that. But there's um, some bragging rights to it. Though. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah. So our our multiple is you know 160 foot sprayers, 80 foot drills, 40 foot heads on the combines, right? So yeah. So you can gotcha. see how yeah you don't need to be a math genius to see how that kind of no, yeah. how that works. So yeah. um, all the numbers work. Yeah, and it's it's not for everywhere. Like you know it works really well in the Regina Plains, especially like heavy clay soil, lots of magnesium, so it's really pl- prone to compaction. So I mean it's a Regina Plains are a, a you know match made in heaven for CTF really sure. right. Yeah. Um, other areas that we farm in though, it's not as big of a deal, right? Yeah. Compaction isn't a big of a thing. It's not as practical. There's more potholes, more bush, more sloughs. So, yeah. you know, we're really only right now trying to focus on a Regina farm with it. I know my brother in Provost is kind of, he's, you know, he's doing a pretty good job of it too, actually. You know, a small, smaller width, 120 foot boom and a 60 foot drill, but uh, he's making, making it work there too. So, um, and it's a process. I mean, it's, it's not one of those things that you can implement and overnight, you know, you see results. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, I'd say minimum five year kind of. Is that right? To, to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, we're not quite there yet. So. No. So on the, on the note of compaction, then it begs the everlasting question, tracks or tires? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> this is the last one. I swear. Yeah. If we get down another rabbit hole here. It's totally okay. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, like it, it's, I'm going to just let you run with this. Because yeah. yeah. Uh, um. I mean, everybody loves a track tractor, right? I mean, uh, yeah. And I, I think what we're finding is um, with the CTF, like your first pass does the most damage, right? So even like, honestly, the sprayer. Sprayer does the most the most damage. But 
back to the tractor, uh, it's, it's the slippage component of it, right? So it's not even necessarily the weight that's on that axle. It's how much that tire or track slips the surface of this heavy clay soil. It, it kind of, it smears it, uh, yep. you know, yeah, and once it's smeared, and you, you need a pickaxe to kind of yeah, <laughs> yeah. To penetrate and instantly that, right? it just hardens up exactly so yeah. obviously the tracks have a little bit less slip on the tractors right so you know we we like the tracks for for pulling the big air drills and and whatnot um grain carts uh <laughs> it's a toss-up you know when i look at the r&m line in the in the the income statement or the profit and loss statement uh, i like tires yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah Tra- tracks are expensive uh, lots of maintenance scrubbing in the corners um yeah yeah and then have you you've never run, have you run a combine with tracks yet no 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 we have not don't plan on uh i don't know maybe if we get a I got a dealer that wants to demo a set uh for a year or so yeah maybe but uh, i know a guy yeah i know a guy yeah yeah Ma- maybe um, he happens to be sitting in the room too oh. <laughs> imagine how that and works you have out to be looking imagine at him. how that works out <laughs> yeah um no it didn't really look i mean we looked at it a little bit when we're going down the CTF thing, uh, I don't, I can't remember now. I don't think the spacing really worked out anyway, so it was going to be super expensive to not really achieve what we wanted anyway, right? So, yep. actually, sure. the New Holland combines are pretty close to three meter center, if I remember right. I think with a simple axle spacer, you can get there. And then, you know, I'm always thinking resale too when we're doing yep. this, right? You know, we have a good relationship with you guys. You know, we, you know, kind of trade cycles that kind of work for both, right? So resale has got to be in the back of my mind with, with any of these decisions. And uh, so singles, I mean, how many commas do you sell with single tires on them nowadays? Zero. There you go. Yep. Zero. So you'd be really mad at me. Yep. Well, you wouldn't be mad at me, but you'd say, yeah, you know what? <laughs> Those tires are yours, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just wouldn't let you do it. Yeah, and if so, yeah, we'd be leaving in the yard yeah. if it never came back. Exactly. So we still run the duels, but with a simple spacer, you can get that outside duel pretty much bang on, or sorry, the inside duel pretty much bang on the, the three meter center. And we just run higher air pressures. You run higher air pressure in the inside duel, lower on the outside. So your, you know, your inside duel on that tram line is taking up the bulk of the load yep. and you still have the benefits, the stability, whatnot of, of the duel being there, right? That's genius. I, yeah. never, so. I never even thought of that. Uh, we had a, we had a guy last year, um, he was hell bent on putting like an inflation system on our air drills and I really? mean, it would have worked. He wanted to be able to, when we got into the field, you know, hit a switch in the cab, it dumped, dumped air out of the tires, lower the air pressure and the tires on the air cart, right? You're down the field, folding up, going to the next one, hit a switch in the cab, onboard, 12-volt compressor, pumps the pressure back up in the tires, right? So, um, you let him, you got to let him work on that. Yeah. And then patent it, it Michael. Yeah. Well, I think, so honestly, we gave him the green light to, to go ahead with it. Yeah. Um, it's just simple, simple components. I mean, I, it wasn't even the price tag of it. It was the, you know, supply chain issues, right? Yeah. This idea kind of came to fruition as we're getting the drills ready for spring. So, I mean, you know, we're a month away from seeding. The components just didn't come in in time, sure. right? So, yeah. but yeah, it's simple, simple components. So, yeah, yeah. And I, they're, they're doing that in Europe. I mean, I think there's sprayers and stuff like that where you can, you know, adjust the air pressure on the fly. So, yeah, yeah, yeah we, we never got there, but... Uh, on your way, maybe. Yeah, maybe. You never know. Well, we'll see. Right we'll on. see. Yeah. I'm going to lighten it up on you a bit here. Sure. You're an owner-operator, Michael. <clears throat> um, your favorite in-field meal... Oh, <laughs> my wife's going to kill me, but uh, everybody's a sucker for some dirty bird in the field, I think, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, everybody's a sucker. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a group favorite, I think. Um, uh, but outside of that, honestly, I, I, I'm a meat and potatoes guy. So yep. anytime there's you know, roast beef potatoes and some, you know, yep. some carrots with some butter on it, that uh, just uh, does the trick there. Yeah. Back in uh, yeah. when I was spending a few da- a few days on the farm, like this is way back, like yeah, nine, ten, eleven years old. Did you ever have hot dog day at your school? We did. Yeah. yeah. Like, do you remember boiled hot dogs wrapped up in tin foil, <laughs> and they come and like the bun like shrank to half its size? <laughs> you throw a little bit of mustard on that, and you had me at hello. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> Fair. Yeah, I remember hot dog day. We had the 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 hoagie or hogard hogard that sub. Oh yeah, sub, yeah, yeah, sub, yeah. Sub sub, sub like once a month, something like that. You got to yeah. yeah. Mom, mom sent two bucks in your lunch pail, and you got to buy a sub. So yeah, I remember that too. Yeah, good yeah. stuff. I got another quiz. I got a quiz here for you, <clears throat> producer Jay. Do you got some restaurants for me? Uh, in your phone, Johnny. Okay, I'm gonna pull my phone out. It's not good podcast etiquette. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to <clears throat> rate Regina restaurants. 
Okay. And so I've got five restaurants here and you have to rate them one through five, but it's not a, it's not an individual rating for each. Like you can't do all five of them are fives. Gotcha. So you got, you got to, you got to rank them. You got to rank them okay. one through five, one being the best and five being, I'm not saying the worst, but probably your last choice. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Here we go. Yeah. Dairy queen. Don't I need to see what the other choices are before I rank these? Nope. Or? Okay. D- dairy queen. Oh man. Are we talking dessert? Or are we talking food? <laughs> ah, probably five. Okay. Earl's. Uh, three. Taco time. Oh, I, I, I'd be lying if I said I'd been there. So oh that, really? That's gonna be a five. Four. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. sorry. Four. So, so well, you've got three, four, and five yeah, taken. There. Jeez. The keg. Oh, your last one better be a good one. We're gonna put the keg at two. Arby's. <laughs> <laughs> that was a setup. Oh man, that was such a, a setup. <laughs> Uh, the old liquefied roast beef. I, I mean, yeah, I think they make like a BLT there that I probably could handle. And again, if you're an Arby's fan, you give her, but like, I'm just, I mean, I'm out on that one. Uh, well, totally well played. Well played. <laughs> yeah. Again, I, I think yeah. I've been to Arby's once in my life. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, Highway 17 in Lloydminster. And that was, once was enough. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah. Was it. Yeah. You felt it the rest of the way home. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. So we've brought in a special guest. Michael's son, Kate, is with us. And the reason we brought him in is that before we started, like last episode, I told Michael to choose his favorite toy on the wall. Michael, and I believe Cade, both chose Big Roy. And I'm bringing Cade in because I think you know more about Big Roy than I do. I won't say I know more, but no. I would think, I think you know more. So, what, Cade, what can you tell me about Big Roy? Uh, it's probably the biggest tractor made right now. It's have has the world record holder and there's one or one more standing I think just one just one left yeah that's what I think yeah yeah we'll have to look into that but I think you're right I think you're probably close I think there's one in a I think there's one in a museum somewhere yeah there's one in a museum and I think that's it that's it have you have you seen it yet have you seen one no but I'd like to yeah I, I I'm pretty sure you saw it it was uh they had an egg, egg in motion just outside of Saskatoon there uh, a couple years oh. ago. It might even be a regular at the Egg and Motion circuit. I'm not sure. You know, now but that we're talking about it, I think I've seen it at Egg Days in Brandon before. Yeah. I think they had it in there yeah. before. Yeah. So I think you have seen it before. But uh, anyway, yeah, it's yeah. a pretty cool piece of iron. It's so awesome. I think we got a little bit of a clip we can show for our viewers that are watching the podcast. Um, obviously anybody that's can see is it's a, it's a definitely a unique tractor because it's got eight wheels on it. Um, it's articulated in the center. So there's four in the front and four in the back. I believe all eight or all four axles are powered. Is that I correct? Think, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, here's, this will tell you right here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's diffs at each one of those. So there far. sure is. Yeah. yeah. So all, all four axles are powered. Yeah. You bet. That's unbelievable. And, there, and there's two engines, correct? I'd be lying if I if I told you, but yeah, probably I think yeah, one in the front, one in the back. Maybe. Kate, can you back this up? Yeah, there's one in the back and one in the front. Nice. Oh well, yeah, w- watching that clip there, the the interior that that takes me back. I was actually yeah. probably about Kate's age. Um, eight seventy five versatile on the farm. I oh yeah, I had the have that kind of cushy padding over the fender wells inside the cab right yep favorite spot to kind of lay back nice and warm there right yeah yeah spent but, a lot uh, of hours in that cab oh yeah burned a lot of diesel uh, and a lot of cultivator shovels yeah. uh, doing doing summer fall look at the simplicity of the cab too like i mean you think about what they've turned into now with yeah. all of our monitors and screens and i mean it's just crazy yeah. to it's crazy to look at and go back that and the other thing about it is while i'm looking at and seeing that single exhaust pipe I don't know. Do they have a diesel particulate filter on that thing? <laughs> or is it a recirc? Is it yeah, a recirc? I'm not, not sure how they got around it. Then, yeah. But, I, uh, yeah. Love I don't it. think there's any emission standards on that uh, thing. We, yeah. we probably shouldn't go down this rabbit nope. hole here. No, but, that's uh, for another episode, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> right on. <laughs> well, hey, guys, I want to thank you so much for coming and thank you for joining, Cade. I, can you come on? Uh, would you come on again and chat with chat farming with us? Yeah. Awesome. You got to bring your dad. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's just you <laughs> and I. Maybe it's you and I do it one day. That'd be more fun. Yeah, could be. I'll let you swear. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Michael, thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, it's always a pleasure seeing you. Always a pleasure chatting with you. It's nice that we get to log one now. Yeah, no, this was uh, 
it was a lot of fun actually um yeah my my wife tells me i like talking too much so maybe <laughs> maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe i have a future in podcasting you never know yeah well i guarantee yeah. i guarantee you this is not your last episode so yeah, i hope you no, come see us again so pre- appreciate that it's been a been a lot of fun and we uh we really appreciate the relationship that we have with you guys at, at major yeah. group so yeah. yeah and that uh that feeling is shared mutually so thanks again michael and thank you to our listeners uh yeah so in episode two thanks very much awesome thanks guys